Welcome to COVID and Climate Change Correlations, a weekly video podcast where I, Daniel Sanderson, engage in a stimulating conversation with post-Keynesian economist Steve Keen. Welcome everybody. I'm uh, I'm with Steve Keen, post Keynesian economist. I'm back again in studio, in virtual studio. Of course, the only way we could do things because Professor Keen is on the other side of the planet, and uh, that is the benefit of our technology these days. Steve, how are you doing this week? I uh, apologise for being late. As I told you off off camera, I, I made the mistake of watching uh, Federer almost uh, lose his way out of Wimbledon first round last night, and haven't really got my head together since then. So I'm a bit on the vague side, but I'll, I'll try to catch up now. So good, but uh, too much to do, including watching my one favourite sport, which is tennis. Yes, 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 yes. Well, you know, there's a thing that's going to have to happen, and I'm going to do a little bit of coaching here for you, Steve, because. Um, I keep reminding you how important you are to society. Okay, so mm. here's the thing: is that the party starts when Steve gets there. You're never late, <laughs> man. <laughs> well, nonetheless, <laughs> I heard I, I heard the story about Princess Margaret, who, of course, was she's a woman who should have been queen, just made the mistake of being born after her sister rather than before, and she would apparently. Uh, you go to dinner parties, great socialiser, and she would turn up hours late and nobody would eat before she got there. And when she got there, she'd pontificate for another three hours and people would be falling asleep with food star- with starvation effects and everything else, and nobody could leave because she was the, the, uh, the, 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 the Queen's sister. So uh, I'll try not to be quite that uh, bad a prima donna. Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. So, Steve, I wanted to start today's episode off with um, a sentiment analysis. and. Um, I know that this is kind of creeping into uh, economics. Okay, is is the mm. is is the sentiment of of populations, right? Yeah. And so what I did is I took a uh, I took this. Uh, in I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen here with you. Mm-hmm. And okay, so. What we're going to be looking at here is a sentiment analysis of some Google News for COVID and climate. Now, Mm -hmm. that's the name and the theme of the show here. Um, This um, this sentiment analysis monitors news and it does this rainbow of color ranging from anger, anticipation, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, Mm -hmm. surprise and trust. I'm kind of skeptical about all these delineations of of um, it's such a an upset like it's such a an, a subjective uh, seems to me like the experiment would be such an, a a subjective checkbox type of thing. Mm, so I'm kind yeah. of skeptical about it, anyways, right? Um, but there 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 doesn't see there seems to be um, a, a pretty straight sort of. Uh, hierarchy here of trust at the higher end of COVID and of climate, um, which is kind of a good thing, I suppose. Uh, You know, what are we missing here when it comes to, we've, you know, this, this, this just basically reiterates the problem that we're having, okay, in communicating complex information. You've got the mathematical proofs, man. Mm. Um, we know climate change is real. Uh, mm. I mean, it's not even it's well beyond the real conversation. And w- you know, we we kind of royally messed up COVID. So what's what's with the human species here? I think the one that, what I was actually intrigued by that pattern was how little change there was over time. There was trust was at the bottom, and and fear was at the uh, at the top. Trust was at the top, and I think fear was at the bottom, and that didn't change all the way through. So you've got to. What, what you get is a tendency for herding in humans. And it isn't just like a, the herd goes in one direction. There are components of the herd that always go in the same direction. So you've always got your people who are you know, fearful and critical of the, of the authorities, but the majority are trusting. And that means what you've got is herd sentiment. You, you don't have uh, individuals all making their own utility maximizing 
independent decisions with sort of nonsense the neoclassicals have. Uh, people communicate with each other and you get a broad spectrum of opinion where most people end up trusting the system as it stands. Now, if, if the system itself isn't making major uh, changes, then neither do the individuals in it. So, again, it comes back to the approach that I take. The neoclassicals, because their theory, uh, you know, they couldn't prove the stability of all the mathematical procedures they thought ruled the marketplace. They couldn't prove that supply and demand um, would coordinate uh, with a multi-market system. They couldn't prove that consumers, you know, would behave the same way and collectively as an individual consumer, so on and so forth. So what they did to compensate with that failure was to create this totally aggrandized vision of humans as people who can actually understand completely the system they're in, so much so that they can anticipate where it's going to go in the future. Uh, that's that's what's called rational expectations. Now that's garbage, of course. Yeah. Uh, but but that garbage has become how the mainstream thinks that people think because it's the only way the mainstream can make their models function. It just shows how bad the models are. Um, but for the rest of us, what it shows is that we tend to trust the current system and it's the structure of the current system and the controls of the current system that dominate rather than individual behavior. Okay, I have a, I have a little inquiry here that has a lot to do with the, um, I guess, maybe a, a Marxist defense of the, uh, of the capitalist structure. Mm. Um, and this is just in response to what you just explained. This to me sounds, and you're describing something that seems, the herd mentality seems to be just a function of the population. So mm. one of the issues that I come across when I'm, when I'm listening to uh, somebody explain a, um, a Marxist theory about, about the power structures and the differences in class and, mm. you know, this in, invariably distills down into something like, uh, you, you know, they're forcing, they're, they're forcing us to stay in this class kind of thing. And I, I don't know if it's so much of the forcing that's happening. Uh, I think it's, it's more what you're describing as a natural phenomenon that we, 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 uh, you know, we cluster in these, in this herd mentality in, in population. Well, yeah. We, we basically adapt to the system we're, we're born into. The system itself can change and evolve over time. And of course, there can be huge political shifts like the shift from feudalism to capitalism, uh, the, the, you know, the accidental, it really was an accident, the communists won in 1917 in Russia. Um, a, a, a couple of incidents gone the opposite way, that you would sort of have the czar there. Um, and the, the, what then happens is that it's the people who determine the overall power structure. Uh, they're, of course, at the top of it, they benefit from it. So they're going to be pushing it as much as they can, and they push an ideology as well. And the vast majority of people go along with that ideology, whether that's what's happening in North Korea or what happens in America. Uh, but what, what, that, what that your little thing showed to me is, as well as there's a dispersal. Uh, not even, you know, we're not, we're not uh, you know, clones of each other. So you do get people at one extreme who are, uh, uh, will just go along with the, with the system as it stands and not really think about it. They live their day to day lives. Um, and then the other end, you've got people who are, you know, joining either Marxists or libertarian groups trying to overthrow the system with a different direction, pushing as, as much as they can. But in most of the time, in most circumstances of history, uh, they're trivial against them, against the inertia and momentum of the system itself. And you're finding you're up against that inertia as well. I mean, mm. but the difference is that you're saying, hey, wait a minute, I have, I have something here that's, I've got a mathematical proof. It seems to work in the past. Why can't we look at it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is, you're talking not about you know, the, the battle of ideology over economics. And um, the frustrating thing for me is that you know, you, people, the, 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 we reproduce ideologies just like we reproduce our, our children. And um, the, the persistence of the neoclassical ideology is enormous. And I think there's, there's good questions as to why is it so hard to shake and why do people become totally uh, besotted with it. And it does come down to, I think, a, 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 again, part of humanity. We are a belief-sharing species. Uh, you know, we don't weave webs. We don't, uh, we, we don't go, you know, skydiving for fish. Um, what we do is we share beliefs and we create structures based on those beliefs. And that 
so the beliefs are an essential part of who we are. And but it always seems we're trying to be, you know, we, we're trying to explain and give a, a rationale that makes sense why things are things are the way they are because they should be. Seems to be part of, but also things can be better. Uh, that's that's part, those are those two elements of humanity. And in neoclassical economics comes out with a vision saying we've almost got it right. We've got a capitalist system, which is the best system you can possibly have, but it's got a few imperfections we should try to remove. And we're going to remove those imperfections and make the place absolutely perfect. And they become religious sellers. And uh, and and the when when you when somebody falls for this stuff, and I saw a guy yesterday on Twitter. Um, I, just, you know, I just read it and I thought, do I want to make a serious reply to this child, or do I just refer him to my new cartoon and annoy him that way? So I referred him to my new cartoon instead, because once somebody swallowed the blue pill, was the, what's the, the blue pill, red pill? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's it's more actually. I'd go back to Jonestown. It's more once they've swallowed the Kool Aid. Uh, they don't they don't die, but they remain in a state of suspended mental uh, mental mental uh, acuity, and everything has to be reframed in terms of the neoclassical virus. So uh, because it's such a um, uh, it, it taps into this I think primal need to talk about a, a perfect perfect system. Um, uh, that makes it incredibly hard to shake, even though it's fundamentally wrong. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can understand that. And and then look in terms of belief, what people are up against. We've got religious structures where I mean, I'm I, you know I'm a philosopher. I talked to lots of philosophers today. I had a really really uh, eye opening conversation with another guest on our our, our show. Yeah. Um, and it was. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he, he comes from a, a, a Judaic Christian background. Actually, he's an Orthodox Jew. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, that every everything informs his life. I'm OK with that. But, you know, there's there's part of our discussion that is. You know, I'd rather I'd rather have the religions we know about. Rather, I don't want to be creating another religion in this um you know, in the neoclassical tradition. And and there's there's something that seems very um, uh, immaterial and um, I guess uh, mythological about our economic system. I would also point to um, Yuval Noah Harari that he does. He calls it like the myth of ca- like it's a myth. This is a this is something that it's it's how we're agreeing to live together. You know, um, yeah. Well, I mean, but if, if, if this is the thing, you say it's a myth, and that's true because if you gave any, if, if you got an alien species landing on the planet and trying to analyze our social system by observation, the last thing they talk about is it being in equilibrium. Yeah. Right? Uh, but that's become the religion of the neoclassicals. That's why I was laughing about this guy that I, I saw a tweet set of tweets from yesterday talking about dynamic. Equilibrium models. There's no such bloody thing. It's just it's it's they're neoclassical being forced into this bizarre contraption because the long run equilibrium of the Ramsey growth model on which the DSG models are based is unstable. So they had to get around it by saying we all uh, no, we we can work out the uh, dynamics of the system. There's a single path that leads uh, to the to the stable. Uh, it, if you imagine a horse, um, which is pointing at some random direction in a field while wearing a saddle, uh, we are supposed to be able to instantly work out which way the horse is pointing and then jump onto a, a cable so that we land on the on the cable and run down perfectly along the spine of the horse on the saddle and slowly fluctuate to be on the... That's how we reach equilibrium because we can all work out, uh, you know, which way the horse is facing. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's nonsense, but they, they fall into it and... Uh, but in the real world, you describe it, it, it capitalism's strengths as well as its weaknesses are its non-equilibrium behaviours. And uh, so we've got a totally mythical view of how the economy operates, dominating how people try to manage the economy. And it's no damn wonder we end up with a suit catastrophe after catastrophe, which has only got worse after the neoclassicals took over in the, the mid-1970s. Yeah. Okay. So the the interesting thing, I think the heuristic that the audience wants to kind of draw upon for uh, for for the the failure of equal equilibrium would that would that be too would that be the the the, the crash of two thousand and eight? It's virtually everything. Uh, okay. But yeah, the crash of two thousand and eight is a classic example of that because uh, the, the neoclassicals 
uh, it, it, a theory gives you a set of goggles, but it also gives you a set of blinkers. Okay. So a theory, this is the, the uh, is a, have you read Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions? Yep. Okay. If, if anybody hasn't read that, bugger off and go read it. Okay. So it's one of the brilliant, brilliant pieces of, of uh, intellectual reasoning, in my opinion. And uh, what he pointed out is the theory selects the facts that, that, it, that it tests itself by. So if you have a theory, uh, it, 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 it's no such thing as an observation three free theory. Yes, we do observe, and that's you know, a critical side of where we, we start from, but the type of division that Popper try, I try to argue between theory and observation is just is, isn't there. It's a meld. And Kern's point was that once you have a theory of something, that indicates the facts you should research. And it also indicates the facts you should ignore. So neoclassical economics, in, the, uh, in terms of the when you look at um, uh, the facts that it directs your attention to, it's the rate of interest, the rate of inflation, the rate of unemployment, and the level of the government uh, government deficit. And those are the the, the, the fund. It's actually not so much the government deficit in terms of the DSG models. It's fundamentally inflation, unemployment, um, I mean, the behavioural parameters they talk about. But in terms of the statistical stuff they'd be testing their theory against will be the rate of interest, the rate of unemployment, the rate of inflation. Now, when you look at all those and you look at the period from 1992-3 through to 2007, all you see is you're approaching nirvana. Okay? Interest rates are falling. Uh, you're coming down. The interest rate, inflation rate is falling very steeply. You've gone from 17% to about 2%. And 2% was the target they chose, what they call the Taylor rule. And you saw the unemployment rate falling and you saw the fluctuations, the cycles falling. Now, looking at those facts, and they are facts, um, you think, great, we're approaching equilibrium. Fantastic. It's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. Now, my theory, which was based on Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, and talks about the importance of private debt, their theory leaves that out completely. So they collect the data because that's what the statisticians set up in the 1940s did with the flow of funds, but they ignore it because debt doesn't matter in their model. Well, it's vital in mine. So I looked at it, and when I simulated my model, what I got was a period of diminishing cycles and unemployment and inflation, um, falling interest rates as well, the whole lot, everything we saw factually, and that was a prelude to a crisis because the, the, the crisis would start with diminishing cycles and then rising cycles. So... Um, now, as it happens, the, the, the real test for a theory should be, well, which one, uh, you know, which one fits the facts better? Well, mine massively better than theirs. But this is where the ideology comes in again. And, and this is what partly what Kuhn talked about in terms of paradigms. Uh, if you have a paradigm which can count as an anomaly, your first reaction is to find ways to modify the paradigm to fit the anomaly. You're not going to throw the paradigm out. So taking on my views would throw the paradigm out. All of a sudden, you'd go from money being unemployed to money mattering. Uh, you'd have to worry about the level of private debt, which otherwise was irrelevant, et cetera, et cetera. So they just tried to modify the paradigm to make it fit the data after the event. And because they could do it, because they've got so many loose parameters, they can fit virtually anything uh, that, that's after the event. They can't have fit before the event. Um, they've gone back to the same old belief system. Well, I see. I see this as a big problem. Then, under your, uh, I mean, don't you? I mean, I, I, I hear just in 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 the small samplings of the news that um, are related to private debt. I, I'm, I'm gathering that we have uh, we're surpassing new levels of private debt all over the world. So yeah, yeah, uh, it's not as not as important. The private debt itself isn't isn't as important because. The rate of growth of private debt is lower this time around than it was before the crisis, and a lot of that private debt's COVID-related as well. Uh, oh, when I, when I look at the data, I drill down into it, and it's basically corporations have been forced to access lines of credit, uh, you know, small companies taking out overdrafts and so on uh, to cover their cash flow. It hasn't been borrowing for spending, and it certainly hasn't been the housing sector. But now that's turning up. Now what we've got after it, that's, 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 the, that's quite worrying, Virtually every country on the planet is in a housing bubble right now because I think a lot of the yeah. money that's gone in to keep the system going during COVID has ended up going into financial speculation once more. That's what that's a worry. Yeah, I was um, I, I was speculating. I don't know if the if, if I'm if I'm understanding the economic uh, rules at play, but the government of Canada um, was 
there were there was rumors that they wanted to raise the interest rates because there was um, I think there was something to do with uh, you know some noticeable inflation numbers mm. and I I was confused by well I, at first I was confused by that and then I just the the housing just seems to be out of control it just keeps climbing yeah and I don't know if if if, if the you know whether it's the Fed or the you know the Canadian uh, you know government is saying, hey, look, we just don't know how to you know keep this you know keep this growth manageable. The the housing just keeps going up. Yeah, that's a global phenomenon, and it's partly because when you throw money as, as they have at the system, pardon me, and you don't have the usual levels of spending people can do, uh, it appears they dive into speculation once more with that money. Now the money, as Michael Hudson put, the money, money, the Fed's money falls on on Wall Street rather than Main Street. Well, that's that's in steroids under under COVID. Um, they thank God the money was pumped out by the government sector to keep people's cash flow going. But it appears that a lot of the the, uh, the QE that's going on is just turbocharging uh, asset markets in general, including I think Bitcoin. Uh, mm. that, that's falling over a bit, but. Um, but yeah, people are just in there gambling and speculating, and that's that's we've, we've had forty years of that now. And if you look at the the growth of the belief in speculation as a good thing, it began in the seventies under again neoclassical economists Markowitz and um, and Sharp and um, and Famer and French and Cohen. Uh, you know, effectively the greed is good mentality in, in economic textbooks, and uh, and and that's conditioned people's behaviour over time. So I see. People, when they get money, the first thought is, how can I speculate with this rather than how can I invest with this? Yeah, yeah, they, they conflate the two concepts of, of speculation with, with uh, I guess, like foundational principles of investing, and that's mm. problematic, right? Yep, yep. I mean, uh, there's actually a very good, uh, one of my favourite books, which has just become available again in the last couple of years, called Dynamic Econo Economic Systems by a mathematician called John Blatt. And uh, Blatt, a brilliant thinker as well as a brilliant mathematician, couldn't couldn't believe how bad neoclassical economics was when he got accidentally exposed to it. Taught himself the entire discipline in a couple of years of very intense reading, and then wrote his own explanation plus critique of the mainstream. But he got to the point about theory, um, saying that uh, speculation is a good thing fundamentally, the, the finance market side of stuff, and he said that. Um, the, the, the theory has is what's called expected utility theory, and this pretty much argues that you, if you have two two potential outcomes, uh, you can have a linear weighting between the two in terms of you know what your preferences are. You can't have a non-linear one because if you become non-linear, according to theory, you become a potential money pump. So people can influence you to go to there and then get back to here again and there again, and each time they do. They're taking fees out of you. That doesn't work. And he said that applies to what he called placement. I uh, said so when you buy shares in Amazon, you can be persuaded to buy shares in Tesla the next day and then sell them to buy Amazon shares a day later. And each time you do it, you're handing over fees to the broker. Um, so that's the money pump side of things, he said. But once you've invested in a nuclear power plant, you can't decide to turn it into a, into a sheep farm the next day. Uh, so in placement is different to investment. Uh, but everything we do in terms of our reasoning thinks in terms of placement. Uh, and again, back to one of Keynes's great statements, when the, when the uh, direction of the economy is set by the actions of a casino, the job is likely to be all done. Well, we've been living in a casino for the last 40 years. Yeah, yeah. And so in that case, in that analogy, in this, this concept that the house always win, who is the winner in that in that? Uh, oh, the house, the house, as you say, the, the finance sector. I mean, the finance sector is far larger than it should be. Right. Uh, anybody who profits out of trade, out of out of the not not out of out of trading as a profit, but trades out of charging fees for trading. Um, that's that's where the Wolf on Wall Street was really good. The same with Matthew McConaughey uh, explaining it to um, what's his name. <laughs> yeah, Leonardo uh, DiCaprio. Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio, yeah. And he said, look, you know, uh, they, they, they get, you've got to keep them in the market. So you see, once they make a bit of money, notional money on one stock, just waiting to put into another stock. And he said, they get an increase in the price of the shares they think they own. We, get a, we, we dock them for cash every damn time. So uh, the parasites, that side of the finance sector, uh, that's what's grown successfully. And at the same time, we've, we've built 
an economy which uh, is incredibly fragile. Uh, as we're seeing now as climate change is striking big time, uh, you know, it, all the investments that we were undertaken, all, all the uh, ostentatious purchases that were undertaken in that bubble period, all the super yachts that people, you know, the, the ultra-wealthy bought for themselves, when we find ourselves in a climate crisis, uh, and that's, you know, the, hello, hello, North, hello uh, southern Canada right now from that front, um, we can't repurpose that stuff. We can't turn uh, one of these luxury yachts into um, you know, uh, accommodation for 10,000 people who are displaced by climate change by heat waves in Canada. Um, yeah. So, so we've got a huge amount of waste coming out of that, and it'll be obvious when the transition occurs. So, I've got a. Um, it's it's not a good surprise. I was frustrated with this one. I approached an economist, and I can't say his name because he won't let me, uh, because his uh, position and this kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But he told me that the, um, and he, you know, he knows the show, so he knows the theme of our show, which is COVID yeah. and climate change. I'd yeah. be glad to know it was an attack on you, but it was. <laughs> But he said, I could not, my mouth drops when I read this. He said mm -hmm. that, the, um, that, that basically the COVID and climate change narratives are bullshit. And Steve, this is, not, this, is, this is not a guy from a trailer park or, you know, and no offense to the trailer park people, but this was, this, this was somebody rather significant and it was obviously off the record, yeah. but my mouth just dropped. And I thought, okay, typically I thought educated person, no direct interest in like, uh, you know, multinational conglomerates or like this kind of thing, you know, like Warren Buffett kind of stuff. What is wrong with somebody that is seemingly educated that just, says a climate change is a bullshit narrative. Like, am I missing something here? Uh, you haven't been indoctrinated in neoclassical economics. That's what you're missing. Um, I'll, I'll have a guess and give the guy, I'll randomly describe it. You know, it's going to look at your facial reaction. You're looking for a file. I'm going to call him Larry. Will that do? Okay. Okay. So that's Larry, um, and I'm thinking of Larry Summers, obviously, here. Um, Larry would be one of who's swallowed the neoclassical narrative about climate change. And it, it, it's a weird narrative because the way it goes is capitalism can cope with anything, therefore climate change can't be a problem. That's how they think. And I just want to, I want to prove that uh, by bringing up a survey that, that Nordhaus did of uh, experts on climate change. Now, Nordhaus's experts included eight economists whom he said in the paper itself their area of expertise wasn't climate change. Yeah. What the fuck are you doing interviewing about climate change then? Okay. Okay. And one of them was Larry Summers. Now, I'm sure Larry is responsible for the quote I'm about to find here. Uh, I'll just actually bring it up. Uh, here we go. You to make the screen a bit bigger, partner. So uh, where is it? Uh, Okay. This is this is this is one economist stated there would be little impact through ecosystems on the economy. Quote, for my answer, the existence value of species is irrelevant. I don't care about ants except ants except for drugs. I don't give a stuff whether you care about them for ants. Uh, you take ants out of the ecosystem, it'd probably collapse. Yeah. Um, so so there's this uh, ignorant arrogance that economists have uh, that really emanates from them thinking capitalism can cope with any, any surprise. Now, of course, COVID's come along, and that's not looking too damn good. So what do they end up doing? A large number of economists end up being COVID deniers as well as climate change deniers. I read them quite frequently. There's a fairly famous one in Australia. There's a mate of mine in the UK, John, uh, so John's last, John Hearn, um, who comes up with this garbage about it just being like the flu. I mean, for God's sake, I've been in touch with nurses in intensive care. This is not like the flu. People yeah. who die of this thing die a far more painful death than anything that comes out of the, the fraction that die of the flu. It's far more contagious, it's far more dangerous, and it's evolving and we don't have any resistance to it as we do have collectively as a species to the flu. 
to some degree. So, uh, but they, they they come up with this narrative because if they don't come up with that narrative, they've got to accept that there should be a market, a, a government intervention to shut the market economy down uh, and, and maintain uh, spending in the meantime, which if you talk to epidemiologists, if we did that for a six to eight week period, we'd wipe this disease off the face of the planet. Simple. So, exactly. Yeah, simple, yeah, yeah. simple. Yeah. So, but, but, but they, they are caught up in having to deny the seriousness of, ch- of challenges because if they if they if they confront that seriousness properly, it means that the the um, the market system can't cope with what we're about to about to experience. Now, equally on, on climate change, uh, I think I told you um, I'm, we, I'm working on a paper for um, the uh, the Royal Society on yep. um, on climate change, and we're opening uh, the paper with um, the absolute abject misreading of a serious scientific paper by William Nordhaus. So um, uh, th- th- there was a paper which Nordhaus said uh, scientists uh, uh, th- did a review of potential tipping points and said they found no critical tipping elements with a time horizon of less than 300 years until global temperatures have increased by at least three degrees Celsius. That's a direct quote from Nordhaus. This, the quote from the um, from the paper was our synthesis of I hate that word of present knowledge suggests that a variety of tipping points could reach their critical point within this century under anthropogenic climate change. And the one that they pointed out most most uh, directly we're seeing right now was happened with a 0.5 degree increase in temperature, which we've already achieved from 0.5 and 2 degrees Celsius, is the Arctic summer sea ice. Now he can read this paper. And the paper blatantly states there were tipping points that are triggered this century uh, and there of, of the nine large-scale climatic systems they looked at, seven of them they thought could be tripped this century. And he says nothing for three centuries until temperatures have increased by three degrees. You look at it and you think, you know, if I, had, if I could see him reading this, I'd be grabbing his head and smashing it against the paper saying, read the bloody words. Yeah. Don't tell me what you would like to see on the paper. Tell me what's written there. And, and so b- because it, it means that they have a, a desire to say capitalism can cope with every, anything, therefore nothing can be a serious challenge. These guys could be seeing a meteor coming for the planet, you know, dinosaurs mark two, yeah, 65 yeah. million years and all that jazz, and they'd be saying, oh, it won't do much damage, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it, it's just this ludicrous belief in the adaptability and flexibility of capitalism and therefore any threat that we face can't be systemic because capitalism can cope with anything, therefore COVID is not a problem and neither is climate change. That's just so ridiculous, Steve. I, I You know, I mean, in one hand, you've got an economic system, right, the, the, the economic proofs that you're trying to move forward, but on the other hand, you're also coming at this with a, a, a climate change issue and and COVID and mm. and 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 and. So, mm. I mean, it's it's got to be overwhelming. I mean, it's it's not like mm. you just have to advocate, you know, to change minds with a, a you know neoclassical. You are fighting, you know, the entrenchment. You're realizing this is probably what really drove you to you know the passion that you that you actually are as a. Yeah. You know, as a public figure, because you know, no matter which way I turn, I'm I'm seeing it, and and I'm and I'm just starting to experience it. You you must mm. have been experiencing it for the last decade, fifty years, really. Yeah, like, mm. like uh, my my first exposure to how economists misread um, climate change data was William Nordhaus's paper in 1972 or three on the limits to growth, or the predecessor to the limits to growth, right, for Forrester's. Um, a global, uh, uh, what do you call it, world dynamics model. And I'd read Forrester uh, in his, his paper, um, the, the book, and I'd read The Limits to Growth when Nordhaus's paper first came out. And having gone through this experience 40 years later, I remembered that experience saying, what the fuck has this guy read? Where the hell did he find that conclusion? Um, uh, so I, but, but I also remember going to a. I wish I could remember the economist involved because there must have been a big, a big shot economist in 1987 or thereabouts. I think it was seven, between 87 and 90, uh, when I was working at the University of New South Wales, 
we were all corralled off to the biggest theatre on the campus, capacity 3,000, to hear this famous economist talk. I've, I've got a feeling it'll be David Pierce. This is just a guess. He's now He died some years ago, an English, famous English neoclassical economist. And I vividly remember him talking about climate change and saying, well, they say it's going to be a couple of degrees warmer. I'll wear one less cardigan during, during summer. I mean, again, you know, meaning the UK, of course. I thought, you moron. Um, yeah, this, so, this so, is ridiculous. Yeah, it's just, you know, I've had 50 years of it. Yeah, this is ridiculous. Um, you know, there's there's somebody that had, carries, you know, fairly big bat in terms of like a public intellectual, this uh, Jordan Peterson. He's somebody oh, yeah. that, right, so he's kind of on a Christian apologetic, clean your room kind of thing. Um, I got a lot of respect for him. He's got courage, but he uh, seems to side with the, you know, the climate change um, as an overreaction. It's it's kind of a manifestation of the left. He had somebody he, on. He's his Canadian, show. isn't he? Yeah, Edmonton. We used to say we flushed twice to get to Edmonton. <laughs> oh, Edmonton. So I can we, we, we actually know where that is in Canada. I'm going to take a look and find out. Uh, I'm just wondering how. I wonder because if he's if he's, um, I wonder if he's enjoying those current uh, 25 degrees above uh, um, normal levels of temperature right now. Uh, yeah, Alberta, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe his experience. I oh, know he's a bit too far north, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Oh. This, I, I was born and raised in, in Calgary, so we had that nice rivalry of the the, the, the hockey teams, right? So it is 32 degrees there right now, and it's 37 degrees at uh, five o'clock. So we, I think yeah, he's getting a certain 38 tomorrow. So, um, yeah, hopefully some of these guys, you know, I mean, the, the thing is you, you can believe there's no iceberg until after the Titanic starts to sink. And uh, in some ways it might be this Canadian heat wave that's the Titanic issue for a lot of people. Yeah, well, it was, it was, it was that, but it was also this, um, the one thing that I wanted to talk to you about was this Bjorn Lornberg. Uh, oh, that, that's yeah, that, that's, yeah, weasel, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, okay, I'm trying to, like, there's there's part of a, a I guess, a theory or, or, or a position. That's almost what it is. It's like a, a position that he's saying we should spend more money on, we could be more effective with spending money in other areas, mm -hmm. right? I'm wondering if this sounds a lot like that argument about the Olympics, right? Like um, we shouldn't spend, you know, you know, millions and a billion dollars on Olympics because we should be spending it on social housing and this and this and this and this. And I look, the, the problem that it puts you into is that it's not that we're, um, if, the, if the Olympics came to a city, right, um, we would spend a billion. The economic benefit would be what it would be, infrastructure, mm. roads, you know, athletic facilities, so on and so forth. If the Olympics uh, yeah. didn't come, there's no money being spent yeah. at all, right? So I just, you know, it's 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 one of these things that it's it's like it kind of traps you because of course I would like to see the world spend more money, like a trillion dollars, and start to alleviate drinking water across the world and proper sanitation and you know all of these kinds of things, right? Part yeah. of me kind of shakes my head and say, "Why can't we do that?" Yeah, right. Um, like, it, it, he, um, he's um, he's a denialist, or rather trivializer, and he like, relies upon the economists all the way through. He cherry picks the scientific data to find holes in any particular paper, and doesn't at all look behind the absolutely tr tr ludicrous um, uh, melange of garbage in the neoclassical. Papers. I mean, if he applied the same critical eye to economists that he does to um, uh, scientists, then why isn't he saying, well, it's obviously crazy for Nordhaus to think that 87% of, of industry will be unaffected because it happens indoors? Yeah. You know? uh, that, that any, anybody with any critical fact would say, well, that's obviously a crazy assumption. Let's criticise that. No, 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 he takes it as gold standard. Uh, that's, that's totally, I mean, the guys, you know, when I look at the behaviour of some of these people, I mean, well, Richard Toll, just seems to be a classic ideologue. I've, I've got some of my own little theories about his psychology, but he seems to believe what he's talking about, as absurd as it is. Um, Lomborg, I read it and I think you must be getting a nice, you must be, this must be a nice little learner for you. Um, 
And uh, most of the time when people tell me somebody is bought off by, by vested interest to have the views they have, I'll say, no, they believe it for free and they, and they, they, get, they get the benefit out of it because somebody will um, you know, subsidise them because they've got the beliefs to begin with that that group wants them to have. But somebody like Lomborg, I look at it and I think, fuck an oath. Um, yeah. You know, th th this is so transparently bad. You're avidly picking apart the science papers to find any uh, little niche that you, you, could, you can undermine the argument with, and you don't even look at the blatantly obvious nonsense that the economists are writing. So I'm very, uh, I, I have, you know, I have no respect for any of these people, but at least I believe that Nordhaus and Toll and Mendelssohn and a few of the others in the economics believe their own bullshit. Uh, I, I, I just wonder whether Lombard finds bullshit as a profitable industry to be in. Well, I think, okay, I mean, let's think about it this way. And I, I you know, I operate a, a you know, a, a small little publishing entity, mostly digital and a, a media outlet. I do work with academics. I work with yeah. thought leaders. Now, my whole point on this is that there, there's an obvious growing trend for academic, for academics to get more of a public, uh, um, I don't know, like representation to sell their books, to build their profiles, mm. to build their brands. And so let's, let's take Lomberg for, for an instance. He mm. puts something out that might be controversial and, like you said, speaks to a particular kind of audience. If it mm. sounds scientific, oh, shit, he's got the credentials. So shit. No, he okay. hasn't, of course. He's yeah. a PhD in political science. Um, right. You know, let, let's just get that right. The, the guy... Uh, doesn't he doesn't even have an economics degree and he certainly doesn't have a science degree so he's in no position to be you know a, a political scientist uh you, you you don't have the credentials to critically assess science papers okay uh you you have to accept them unless there's a blatantly obvious mathematical error that you have the capacity to point out uh, so he doesn't have the credentials. He has a deep PhD. Uh, it's it's not in basket weaving, but in terms of climate science, it might as well be. So what would be well before I get onto the point about what the what the what the uh, effectiveness of a political science degree would be used for? I do know that I was listening to this interview. He actually has a group of people that are trying to work with countries here. Like this is how much of a, a you know of a franchise that he's building. Right. So it's, oh, yeah, yeah, the Copenhagen Institute. Yeah. Right. And so this is this seems scary to me. So you know, then back to my point about the political science degree. What I mean, I, I mean, I would say a couple degree with an economics degree might be a really good you know, starting point, but he doesn't have that. So is it more like a um, uh, a political science degree uh, would, would give you the ability to be a commentary on, 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 on the political, you know, comings and goings of our society, but that's... Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah that's, that's more, more the sort of stuff that Nate Silver might, uh, you know, you might find yourself sitting next to Nate Silver talking about the next electoral outcome. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's not the sort of thing which you should be involved in deciding uh, whether climate change is happening or not, or whether climate change is serious or not. Um, and, and this, this, I mean, this is one of the areas where I'm, as much as I regard economists as not experts, they're not experts on the economy, they're experts on a false model of the economy. But most other disciplines are experts in their own area, and I have you know, an immense deference to them. For example, if they tell me COVID's dangerous, I accept COVID is dangerous, and they've told me precisely that. If I read an epidemiologist telling me how to suppress it, that's the way you do it, not the way the economists advise, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but... Yeah, he's 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 pulled in people who are of like mind, and they're being funded by you know like, you know I don't, I don't know who the actual funding is for the Copenhagen Institute. I have looked at it occasionally. Uh, I think there's a fairly large number of oil and coal interests in there. Um, so this is part of the, the 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 blizzard of alternative ideas that comes out when either you get a, you know a, a major uh, element of society being criticised, like, for example, cigarette smoking, you can find somebody somewhere who's going to argue that cigarettes are good for you with a PhD, appropriate PhD to it. There's always going to be somebody on the spectrum and you find them and fund them and he's pulled them together for climate change at the Copenhagen Institute. Wow, that's scary. Scary, Steve, really is scary. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, you just, you know, that's why I think this, this kind of series and the work that you're doing, especially what you're doing with the, um, you know, the, the paper that you're going to release is just, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely, I mean, you could say it's a godsend whether, I mean, it just is, it's, it's going to be, uh, hopefully, hopefully it's going to kind of usher in the change that we need. Yeah. Well, I, um, my feeling is it won't, um, I, I'm just hoping I can get the scientists to be a, I, 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 what my, my ambition is to get the scientists realizing how bad economics is and how much economics has undermined uh, their work on climate change uh, and get them to t attacking the economists directly. Um, that would be some chance to give a, a warning before we hit a serious crisis. But again, looking at the madness in Canada right now, the climate madness up there, um, we're likely to see drastic impacts on the climate coming through this decade. And as they start coming through, uh, then we're willing to say, well, who dissuaded us not to worry about this? Now, the first thing people are going to look for are the obvious vested interests, the Koch brothers, the oil and gas companies, and so on. And they've done a large amount to promote de delay and denialism on climate. Um, but the economists have fueled it by providing the, 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 the foundation for analysing it and saying it's no big deal. And they may well manage to escape attention during this whole damn thing. I'm trying to make sure they don't escape attention. I want to point this out and saying how bad their work is. Uh, but I think, you know, it, it, we're only, only going to get people like myself having some impact on actual policy after we're in a serious, it's after, after it's obvious we're in a serious climate crisis and we have to radically change the direction of society then they might listen to people like me. But even then, there's no guarantee of that. Well, and we have to, you know, you'd think it's obvious because that kind of definition is, it, it should not be open to subjectivity. To me, it's obvious. To you, it's obvious. It, you know, it's just, mm. we got to get the herd to make sure that it's obvious. So one last question before we kind of wrap up. I think that's, uh, you know, pretty close to this, this, uh, this, uh, today's event. Um, there is a dialogue in uh, in in our society that we should take from the the wealthiest, you know, like strip some of their wealth down. I don't agree with that at all. I don't think that's um, becoming of a society where people have actually earned income or money and resources. I don't think that's. But in the previous example that you just gave with the Koch brothers, and I mean in particular uh, with. Uh, economists that hold almost like a liable position in these types of um, situations, there, there, there feels like a last kind of grab at what's remaining while you can get it. It's a looting of sorts. It feels like a looting, right? We're in a state of emergency, and the the looting that's taking place is from the uh, you know the people that that have access to the goods and the money and the. You know, that's what it feels like to me. Do you see any kind of resemblance there? In a sense, I do. I mean, I'm, uh, certainly the, the oil and gas interests that have funded misinformation on climate change, they have every reason to have their, their wealth stripped from them completely. And I think we're going to have to do things like that if people won't take the change in direction seriously. We need some sacrifices, okay? If you're going to say you've seriously changed direction, you have to see people who are incredible wealth now being uh, you know, pushed at the opposite extreme uh, as a direct consequence of what they've done. Otherwise, if you try to enforce uh, you know, a future society to try to <clears throat> curb our damage to the climate and go in the opposite direction, I don't think that the mass of people will have that trust we showed at the beginning of the segment unless they see the people who, who led to the situation where now are punished for it. So how do how would you see that this could move into like a judicial framework, right? I mean, you know, well, that's that's happening. There's actually a group of lawyers who are developing a, a law they call ecocide. <coughs> and so you know, we've had genocide. This is ecocide, mm -hmm. and um, and and I think that sh should be enabled as a law, and it has to be retrospective. Okay, because it, if you only do it after the, this, this is a bit like genocide. The laws about genocide, I think, were developed after the Nazis you know, killed six million Jews. You don't want to say, "Oh, we're sorry, terribly sorry." You didn't know it was illegal beforehand, so we can't prosecute if you're no sorry. You should have had the ethics to understand it was illegal when you did it. We're now putting a law that means we can, in the case of the of the genocide, 
over the Nazis, we can hang you at Nuremberg for the crimes you've committed against humanity. Well, these are crimes against the ecosphere. Yeah. So that is happening and I'm supporting those objectives and I, I just I want to make sure it's not just the oil executives who end up there. Here, here. Um, I'm going to do some more research on that. And as always, Steve, you're such a wealth of information. I'm going to be doing more digging and, and you know, posting some articles and stuff. But thanks again. You're just... Oh, don't, uh, don't go too quickly because I want to share something too. Oh, okay. Want, okay. And that's this just just recently my my cartoon book has been... Um, uh, it's, been, it's been published. I've got, one of, I've got two cartoon books that I've uh, written, one called Econ Comics, and that's being syndicated by Arcaven Comics uh, starting this week. So if you go to Arcaven Comics, you can, you can find it by going to my Patreon site. This is a link straight from Patreon, but Arcaven Econ Comics, and that's what you'll see when you go to and you click on here and you see the first syndication of my little satire in economics. Is that so, you, Steve, uh, there in that little... Yeah, that's, okay. that's a caricature of me, yeah. <laughs> right on. Okay, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a bit, of, a bit of fun writing this stuff. There's three, three satires. This is the first one on David, on, on Ricardo. Yeah. And um, the next one is uh, uh, coming out in uh, a week's time. I believe every week I'll put out, you know, four frames of the cartoon. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's on your, your Patreon account, right? That's a, no, this is actually, I've linked to it from my Patreon account. This is actually like a, another um, uh, website called uh, Archaven. But if I go to my Patreon site at the moment, that's, that's the most recent post. Let's bring up Patreon here. i got to get in your Patreon too. Um, Please. <laughs> yeah, i got to do that. Okay. So there's, that's where I've got the, uh, the link. Um, waiting for it to come. Okay. And that's what you'll see. And then click here, you get to Archaven. And then there's a little blurb about me. And then you click on the truth about economics and you get the first cartoon. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to spend some time on that. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll have a chuckle or two, hey? Yep, hope so. Okay. And I'll right try on. to be on time next time, Daniel. Okay. Oh, no problem. Don't sweat it. You're awesome, Steve. Okay. We'll talk to you later. Okay, bye. Right.